<laughs> okay. All right, go ahead. All right, this is an interview at the Division of Military and Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York, 13th of July, 2005, approximately 9 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Francis Martin Sheehan. Place of birth, Albany, New York, Child's Hospital, February 1st, 1920. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, Twelve years at the Ascension Institute in Albany. I lived on Yates Street, and the Ascension Institute was also on Yates Street, so getting up was very easy. Graduated from the Ascension Institute and uh, uh, attended, uh, graduated from Siena College. However, uh, was uh, drafted before graduation in 1942. Uh, I think I had six credits that I needed. And uh, when I was over in France, they sent me my degree uh, from Siena College. And uh, and I went back after the war and took more accounting and more courses. Uh, further on, went into the trucking business, went to Russell Sage, and, and uh, took traffic and transportation. Uh, and at the age of 65, retired from uh, my business, which I turned over to my wife and two of my children, and got bored and uh, studied, became a stockbroker uh, at age 65 and got my NASDAQ certificate at Northeastern University in Boston. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were uh, when you heard about Pearl Harbor and your reaction? Yes, I do. I was in Herbert's Tavern on Madison Avenue, and it was on a Sunday, and uh, we were all terribly shocked. We, now, the draft had been in effect, so we knew that we were all going to be drafted. Uh, however, I, and many, many of us went down and tried to enlist, I was in 4F. I was uh, not, I could not be drafted. Uh, I had spent a year in bed when I was about 14 years old. Then they never knew what I had, but I ran a fever of 102 every day for almost a year. I weighed uh, at that time 108 pounds. And uh, when all of my, after the war got going, people got drafted or enlisted, uh, I wanted to be in it also, and I owe everything to a Dr. Lillian Thal, who was down on Madison Avenue in Albany. He was interested, it had something to do with the draft, but he, he gave me a program, uh, diet and uh, exercise and it got me up to 116 pounds and uh, got me into the, the they finally drafted me. Now um, where did you go for your basic training? Uh, initially Edison in uh, New Jersey, Camp Edison for basic training and uh, my uh, after I finished Edison, uh, Fort Monmouth which we had to hike to Fort Monmouth, and part of the, the uh, graduation was you had to hike the uh, 21 miles to Fort Monmouth under a full pack. Uh, then they, uh, I was deemed to be a wireman, so I, got, I was put into a uh, wire, field wire chief class, though I had never done anything more than plug in a plug in my life. Uh, I had, uh, not, uh, I think, 90 days or three or six months to learn how to be, to take switchboards and teletypes apart, rebuild them. I did that. When I finished the course there, 
I thought I was going to be, I was told I was going to be an instructor there. So we got married. Uh, well, we actually had gotten married when we were at Edison. And uh, jo I married Joan Morrissey. And uh, well, she, she was from the Albany area also? She was also. We lived within a few blocks of each other and didn't know each other. Uh, until later on in life, uh, later on then, before the war. Uh, anyway, I thought I was going to be an instructor at Fort Monmouth. We had a rooming room down in Fort Monmouth, near Fort Monmouth. However, the next thing I did, knew, I was ordered to uh, get ready to go overseas and uh, sent to Youngstown, Ohio, from Youngstown, Ohio to a staging area in Taunton, Massachusetts. And from there aboard the Queen Mary and uh, we were on our way to England with 4,000 other troops. Uh, we landed in Edinburgh. Now when was this that you, you went overseas? Uh, this Approximately. Was in 1943. For, uh, 1943, and I can't tell you, it must have That's been. That's okay. Uh, was to the fall of 43, I'm mm -hmm. just guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, we landed in Edinburgh and then were trained to put on a train to Litchfield, which was the 10th replacement depot, a casualty replacement depot. And one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, they called us out to the parade ground. We stood uh, and they called our names out and told us we were selected to volunteer for the 101st Airborne Division. That we would be received for at least six months training before we would go into combat. And it would hope we would volunteer. If we didn't volunteer, it was left to your imagination. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think they indicated where who, that we would be in a frontline infantry company. <laughs> Too sweet. Uh, so we went, so I became a part of the 101st Airborne as a wire man, which I quickly changed over when I, uh, I got the opportunity to the Signal Corps, because my background, uh, even though I had passed and, and could do all of the wire duties, uh, I was better fitted for the Signal Corps. Now why why do you think you're better? Uh, my training as an accountant and, uh, in college, uh, I just was not a hands-on kind mm -hmm. of guy, really. And uh, electricity was not my forte. I could do it. I could do it by rope. Mm -hmm. I learned how to handle a soldering iron, though I got burned as much as <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, but I learned how to read the schematics and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was more comfortable in uh, wire, and you didn't have to go out at night in the woods and uh, repair broken wires either. Uh, now, did, did you get any jump training at all while you were? Uh, mm -hmm. First thing they did was make us go to paratroop school uh, because they were definitely uh, wanted paratroopers. So we had to get up every morning and run four miles, which I never could do about one mile, and then I'd walk, and then I'd run, and, and uh, however. Now, where did you go for that training? And that was at, when we were at Newbury, uh, and it was near Newbury, and, and near the castle in Newbury, and the back woods there, and uh, we would, would be trained around there. Uh, Uh, we, that continued to, uh, through the jump, the towers. We had to jump off some platforms and that sort of stuff. And finally, uh, they took us up in a, a C-47 and told us uh, that what we were expected to do, we would have a parachute uh, on the back and an emergency chute on the front. 
uh, when the jump master uh, told us to stand up and hook up, if we stood up, we were volunteering to be a paratrooper. Once you stood up and hooked up your static line, you had to go because you jeopardized everybody else in the stick. And the stick was 15 members, 15 men, uh, all with, equipped as you were, who had to get out that door in eight seconds. Uh, I decided not to stand up by, and uh, there was another fellow and myself, there may have been three of us, uh, we did not stand up. Uh, I looked down and I didn't like that idea at all. And I had had training under CAA when I was in Siena, I had flown, I had flown Piper Cubs, and uh, I didn't get my license, but I had done my cross country and flown quite a bit. So I was really, gliders were more my thing than going out that door with the little ants down below there. It, it just was not my thing. So I stayed, and uh, when we got to the ground, they told me I was now a member of the glider troop. Uh, so from there on in, I trained with the glider troops, learning to tie down gliders, learning to tie down jeeps in a glider and a small backhoe, which we loaded into the gliders. Four motorcycles and uh, five men, six actually counting the pilot, six men. Um, so we learned how to handle gliders. Uh, when they, somebody told them, I don't think I did, but somebody told them I had had flying background, so I rode as, uh, as co-pilot in the glider. And, uh, now, what uh, type glider was that? Was that the Horsa? These American gliders, CG4As. Okay. Uh, however, we all preferred the Horsa glider. You, you know the Horsa glider. Uh, I'm familiar well, the with The Horsa was the English glider, and it was much, much better made. It was plywood, mm -hmm. uh, plywood and, and tubular steel. Ours were canvas and uh, plywood, and you could walk through the side of it. Uh, we had wheels, of course, in training when, when we had to do uh, five jumps every month because we got 50% extra pay. So we had to, so uh, one day a month, we go up and down and we do five glider flights, five landings, five takeoffs. And we get assigned, and we get our 50% extra pay. The uh, paratroopers would do the same thing. They get out to the airport and make their five jumps. Uh, it was either five or six, I can't remember, for their extra pay also. So uh, in, in those cases, we had the wheels on. When you went into combat, we had uh, the wheels would drop off, and you landed on the skid. Hopefully, the fuselage landed between trees. The wings came off easily anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, the horses were better built, but the wings came off pretty much just about the same as easy. But they're much more comfortable glider, mm -hmm. better glider, much better made. But we had thousands of them, and uh, there were only hundreds of horses. Uh, the, the same thing, we won the war because we had more of everything. Excuse me. We had more tanks. Uh, we had more gasoline. We had, better, we had more guns. Not better. The Germans. Did had you ever fly in a Hossa? Or oh yes, I flew in a Hossa quite a bit. Uh, in fact, when I could, I flew in a Hossa. It was much much more. Now, did you always fly as a co-pilot, or were you ever no, the pilot? No, very often I just rode in the in the glider. But uh, somebody told them that uh, I can't remember that I. Maybe I did, but I don't think so. I think somebody told them, one of my guys told them, they say she has had some experience. So, so I wrote it as a co -pilot. So Okay, so how long did you train? Uh, uh, probably th several months anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, this was part of the training because in the morning you went over the obstacle courses and you did your running anyway and your physical mm -hmm. training. And uh, th then we did other training, uh, to gas, uh, gas mask training, to tear gas training, uh, 
and uh, firearms training with uh, rifle, uh, with automatic uh, submachine gun, and uh, 45 caliber uh, sidearm Colt, which I couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Uh, I was, in, and by the way, I was a very, very good rifle shot, mm -hmm. uh, very good. And, uh, uh, but did you get any? Excuse me. Did you get any Signal Corps training also? Oh, of course. Since you were, oh, of, course. Uh, of course. Now, what did that consist of? Uh, coding messages, mainly because I was in maybe a message had a clerk. Uh, our training was with the encoding machines, setting up encoding machines, encoding, handling the uh, message center clerk duties, handling uh, messages uh, according to the, uh, whether they were top secret Sagaba or uh, low rated secret messages, how they were encoded, how to handle them. Uh, the uh, whom, uh, how to handle your messengers in jeeps which went out to the regiment, uh, the routes, the handling of uh, top secret um, uh, messages and other uh, other things that came from. The uh, from the general offices or the secretary or the, or the uh, now what was your rank at this time? General. At that time, I was a co uh, corporal technician. Two so they really didn't give you much for your your college or uh, at that time. No, we, we, this was before combat. Mm -hmm. No, no. Yes. the uh, uh, that. It's true. We didn't get many more money rankings. We had 290 members. Uh, my immediate uh, supervisor was a buck sergeant, C.K. O'Connor, who became a staff sergeant. Uh, I had a master sergeant. Who, no, no, he, he lives in Florida, and for the moment I can't remember his name. Mm -hmm. But and he's still alive, and uh, and. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, still fairly well. Now, uh, did you have much interaction with the English people at all? Constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in town. We were in, in every weekend we would, that we could, we would get passes to London. The Blitz was on. So we used to go to a Red Cross um, center in Marble Arch where we stayed. And uh, at night, every night, the blitz would be on, and we'd get out under uh, fairly undercover and uh, watch the searchlights and uh, the ACAC -ac going on. You had to be undercover because the ACAC -ac was dropping steel mm -hmm. uh, constantly through the city, and uh, the mostly it was you would see the, the planes shooting. Uh, what, what they call it, uh, f f f you could see they was going across the sky. When Tracers? Tracer bullets, yes. The tracer bullets going across the sky, you would see, and of course the bombs would be re dropping around the city. Uh, and uh, we, were, the, we, we would get down to the subways, the English people were all lying in the subways with their family. Um, blankets uh, and, and, and uh, I guess we thought we weren't going to get killed. Yep, 22-year-olds, they don't think they're ever going to die. So we would go up and watch everything, and then when the home guard uh, building would get hit, we'd help them pick up, pick up pieces and uh, help people out of their ruins, uh, help the ambulance crews, and uh, it, that's just something we did. Mm -hmm. uh, Later on, as the war went on, the, um, the, the terror over London changed a bit. We'd be, everything became buzz bombs, and you would hear overhead the uh, ch, 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 ch. And uh, then when that would stop, 
he would wait for the bomb to hit. And uh, hopefully it was not next to you. But uh, we watched the buzz bombs come down. I, I would not like to do it again, but I'm glad I was there. Uh, London was un unbelievable. The people were unbelievable. Uh, we, we, there were a couple of hotels that we could get cold beer. English beer is not cold. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could, there were two hotels that we could get cold beer. Uh, so that's why we were in London. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, um, how long, well, when did you, were you aware that there was uh, an invasion going on? Well, we knew <laughs> that there was going to be yes. an invasion. Uh, of course, we were being prepared uh, in our barracks. We were being issued ammunition. Uh, we were being issued um, hand grenades in our barracks and, and belts with packets of uh, rifle grenades, hand grenades, uh, bandoliers of ammunition, uh, and trenching tools. Uh, I quickly got rid of the heaviest ones. Remember, at this time, I probably weighed about 120 pounds, maybe 122, possibly, maybe 120 pounds. And uh, by the time they issued me, my, by the time I had my pack, and uh, rifle grenades, hand grenades, uh, two bandoliers of ammunition, of clips of ammunition. Uh, I had a, managed to get a folding stock carbine. They had issued me an M1, but the damn thing weighed 11 pounds without a clip in it, and I soon got rid of that. And then I got rid of most, a lot of the uh, clips of ammunition because I knew what I could carry and what I couldn't carry. And uh, I might need it, but I needed to be able to move. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, we had some things happen in the barracks. In fact, in cleaning our guns, we had one boy, a couple of cops away from me, and I won't think of his name now. But he was, he had his Thompson machine gun and he put the clip in and let the bolt slide forward. And if you know anything about Thompson machine guns, that's when they fire when the bolt slides forward. And a uh, 30 caliber, and he hit a boy in the stomach right across the way and the boy just looked at him and I was sitting, and I was there watching him, I heard the shot. And he said, you silly asshole, you shot me. And uh, we had <coughs> got it getting him to the hospital. By the way, he was back in the company again in three weeks. Wow. Uh, Boy, he was lucky. 30 <laughs> caliber, right? Stomach, yes. uh, we uh, then were loaded up, and finally, the, the final insult, because uh, I was head of uh, my group, uh, squad, uh, they brought me a cart, a round cart, and about a foot long, and it had two pigeons in it. And uh, that also I had to carry. So finally I get all hooked up and I'm sitting on the bunk wondering how I'm going to stand up. And finally I got stood up and fell out. Uh, they were, we were called outside for and uh, called to attention. A lieutenant, I don't remember think who at the moment, at the moment uh, called his right to, to right face, head forward, gave the march, command to march. And then uh, everything would have been fine except that he said double time and my fifth step I fell right on my face <laughs> and I couldn't get up. Two guys picked me up. <laughs> this is probably one of the most embarrassing and I tell this now mm -hmm. because but the most embarrassing time of my entire life because I got two big paratroopers holding me up. I'm carrying about 165 pounds and I weigh about 120. And uh, I can walk, but I can't. <laughs> the, the, the lieutenant came back and said, who's holding up the braid? And I said, I'm afraid I am, sir. And he said, my God, you'll get us all killed. <laughs> 
Anyway, right after that, I, we, were at the, we were going to the marshalling area and said, which was in preparation for Overlord, which was the invasion. Uh, I tried to tell him, by the way, my anniversary was 6543. The invasion was 6643, but it was scheduled for 6543. And I tried to tell my wife, and I said, our, our uh, first anniversary will be quite an explosion. And they cut it all out of my letter. And uh, anyway, they, they changed it to the next day. It had to be because of weather. The invasion had to be changed to 6643. But we were going out to the marshalling areas. And uh, they called me in and they said, Sheehan, uh, you're going to stay back in the castle. You're not going with us. And uh, I said, uh, is there a reason, sir? And he said, yes. He said, uh, Sergeant Mobs, a fellow named Frank Mobs, whom I owe a lot to. He was out at the airport and, at, and uh, he was doing practice jumps. And his chute didn't open. And there were 15 of them. And as he came down, he grabbed another boy by the legs, whose chute had opened. As he went past him, his chute was dragging. Mm -hmm. He grabbed them by the legs, and the two of them went down in one chute, which meant that they traveled much faster than 16 feet per second. Uh, he broke two vertebrae in his back, and uh, he was going to handle the rear, and they let me take his place, or they ordered me to take his place, for which I didn't give too much art to. So I went over uh, in, uh, later in a C-47, uh, over uh, to France. Mm -hmm. Now when, when did you go over, approximately? Uh, uh, oh God, I can't tell you, but probably uh, the division was probably a month after that. Mm -hmm. Probably, uh, I'm not sure, but probably a month after that. We went. Do you want me to continue? Oh, yes, sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, when after the invasion and after the, uh, the as soon as the division, our division was simply a strike division. It was supposed to be a strike division. We were supposed to go over the lines, then come back, and and we were always supposed to be surrounded. That was by design. The 101st Airborne was designed to go over the lines of the enemy and then strike them from the rear. Uh, after the invasion, we were put, the 101st was pulled out. We lost, uh, I think, about 12,000, 12, 15, 16,000 men. We came back to England and uh, we got a lot of new replacements, as I had been a replacement from the division in Italy. I was replacing some deceased member uh, of the, the company and who had gotten killed in it. Uh, we came back after the base division came back. We got up to strength again. And we then were uh, told that we were going to Holland. And the, the, next, the, the next one was we, we went to Holland. Uh, the division went into Holland, and this was not a well planned, as history will tell you. It was a combined English American uh, invasion in, uh, to Eindhoven and Arnhem, the 82nd at Arnhem, the 101st at Eindhoven. And we, uh, we got fooled. They were not old troops, they were frontline troops waiting for us, they were waiting for the division, and they came down and we lost a tremendous pile of guys. guys did, did you go in in a wider? Or? I went in on a C-47. C-47. And I went in after the, the, uh, the it was known that it was not going to be a success. I was only there for five or six hours and they told me to back. And I think that we went back to set up a message center at Mormolan, and Mormolan, which was near <coughs> uh, Reims, or Reims, as the French say, about uh, 40 miles away from Reims, and it was at Auxerre uh, in, in uh, France. Uh, and then we were, the division came back there, 
and uh, we were stationed at Auxerre de Dare until uh, we went into Preston. And uh, we were uh, in tents there in Auxerre. Uh, but it was it was a nice it was a nice place. Uh, there was a, a hospital nearby and, uh, that I can remember, and we had the uh, champagne companies not very far away, and we used to send a jeep <coughs> to the, to the, the oh God I can't even remember the name of the champagne company that was right near there, famous uh, champagne company. Rothschilds? No, no. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'll think of it. Anyway, we used to pay. We had to bring bottles because they had no bottles. So if you brought bottles, uh, champagne cost 90 cents. And this champagne is uh, $49 or $50 a bottle right now. And, 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 uh, and we would load up the Jeep with champagne. And uh, Anyway, uh, we were next there for quite a while. Uh, it's where we lost our chief of staff, a wonderful, wonderful colonel by the name of Ray Milner. And uh, he tragically died in uh, Auxerre. Uh, I, I happened to be there the night that he died. My family had sent me a silver fountain pen. This was before we had ballpoint pens, silver. Okay, continue. Uh, my family had sent me a silver wall, I think the name is W-H-L, I think the name is something like that. Uh, anyway, I was working this night and uh, he came out, a handsome fellow, just, just a wonderful guy, and uh, he borrowed my pen and uh, I never saw the pen again. Or, no, I never saw the pen again. Uh, tragically, we lost him that night. Uh, How did he die? It's suicide. Oh. Yeah. It's a, it was a tragedy. Uh, and we don't know why. We don't know what in his life, what, what happens mm -hmm. to him. Uh, anyway, from there, we, one day we were, uh, I was told, to get a jeep and uh, a trailer, and uh, we were going to load up. Then going to a little town up in Belgium, the Germans had broken through, and uh, we loaded a message center jeep and a radio jeep, and I can't remember the radio people and a wire jeep, uh, jeep and trailer. Three of us took off. Um, with uh, in a convoy, and we headed into this little town. We had strip maps like we have today, and we headed into this little town called Baston, which was up in Belgium. And uh, when we got there, it was as peaceful as could be. It was, uh, and we got to a field with hay mounds on it, and it was late in the afternoon, and. Uh, uh, it was quiet as a church, and I took my bedroll and put it in one of these mounds of hay, dug into the mound of hay, put my bedroll in there, and uh, at dusk about five o'clock, and uh, we ate our cake rations, and uh, went to bed. And the, the, the next morning we were up early, and a farmer came out and uh, gave each of us a little little glass of schnapps, and uh, everything was quiet for, for a time. And uh, then we moved into the town. We were now quartered, going to be quartered in a school there. And we were in a bay. We were set up in our message center in a basement of the school in the town of Bastogne. And the general was in an office in back of us, had to go through our message center office. We had about a 40 by, must have been a 40, 30 by 40 office, maybe 40 by 40. It was pretty size, good size office with tables set up and our encoding machines on it and all of our 
uh, typewriter, teletype machines, teletype machine there, and so forth. And uh, the, the first thing that happened was that night. Uh, I was in a room down the hall, and the ADH shells started falling, and they hit a room next to me. And uh, man, I took off like a big bird. I grabbed my clothes like this, and my the, the, the folding stock carbine, and uh, my boots, and I hit a slit trench and laid in the slit trench for the next two hours. And it was kind of winter. It was, it was no snow on the ground, but it was late fall. And, well, it was winter. It was in December. It was the 19th. Of, now, did you 19th have in December? Were you given any winter gear? Uh, at the time, I had my overcoat. Uh, I had my boots. I did not have over boots or anything like that. No, this was a sudden. Mm -hmm. uh, this was sudden. Uh, but I had plenty of. Uh, uh, I had planned it ahead of time, and I had a chance. So I had put two, two or three felt inner liners in my sleeping bag inside and I had plenty of access to uh, and I had put on uh, I had uh, two pairs of felt pants a set of long johns and a set of uh, cotton underwear and I had two or three sweaters available to me so I, I was very comfortable now the guys in the, 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 the riflemen in the regiments they didn't have this mm -hmm. advantage that I had uh, and uh, luckily, thank God, that I did have all the, and I had extra blankets. I think I had six extra blankets, which I threw in the, in the, the uh, trailer also. And uh, anyway, the, the, the first night, they killed four of our uh, men. I think they were four wiremen uh, in the room next to me. and. Uh, we, I stayed in the slit trench all that night, and the next, next day, uh, some of our guys were out under a tree, and we lost a few more because they, this plane came, plane or several planes came over, strafing, and these uh, youngsters, not you, not using their head, and most of the time we lost the youngsters. They were the ones that we lost most because they would do things without thinking. They started firing rifles at the plane from under a tree. And of course, the plane strafed them and killed several of them. Uh, you know, you, you don't stand under a tree and shoot at a plane that's got a uh, submachine gun that fire a thousand rounds a minute. Uh, you get a slit trench and you lay at the bottom of it and you pray. <laughs> we did a lot of that. Uh, anyway, the next day, uh, Days went on, and within a couple of days, we found we were surrounded. I had a brother who had been in the 99th, who was in the 99th Division. He had gone to college down at Louisiana State University, and when the Germans broke through, they grabbed them all out of the college. They formed the 99th Division, and they sent them over, and they were to the north east. east of us, uh, and that was how I found, I tried to see him, and I found I couldn't see him, and that was when I first found we were surrounded. Then uh, we, we knew we were surrounded, we got a letter from uh, General McAuliffe, who had taken over from General Taylor, and uh, General McAuliffe gave us a note of, with a picture of a donut. And he said, picture a donut. And he said, that's the Germans. And he said, picture the whole, and we, that's us. So we were surrounded by seven uh, divisions of German troops. Uh, however, uh, this was what the, our division was designed to do. And it was designed to fight in this fashion. And we would run our reinforcements, and the Germans weren't smart enough to attack at the same time on all sides. They would attack one side after another. 
and we would quickly move uh, our men from one side of the hole to the other and repulse the Germans. And uh, this was fine, but we were running out of uh, uh, running out of ammunition, running out of food, and the weather was very bad. And it was snowing, and it was uh, fog, and the, uh, we were not able to get C-47s into us for supplies until uh, finally the weather cleared. And uh, you, you know the rest is history. General Patton broke through to us, and uh, uh, we were down to uh, some ersatz coffee that we found the Germans had left behind. And uh, we, were, we were using snow for water, and uh, we were melting snow. And we were using our sons of coffee made out of snow, and uh, uh, we were down to a, a K ration and uh, one meal at, the, at nighttime. Uh, Can I ask you a question? Were, did you see General McAuliffe that often? No, I didn't see him that often. I would see him once in a great while. I saw him when Patton came in. Uh, in fact, I have a picture there of uh, when Patton came through, the two of them met, and mm -hmm. I got a picture of him. I was up top. Uh, sergeants don't get close mm -hmm. to generals. Yes, yes. Believe me. Right, and just anyway, sergeants don't want to get yeah. close to generals. Someone that we interviewed claimed that McAuliffe, when he said nuts to the Germans, was drunk at the time. Oh, no. I don't think so. No, I, I don't think so. I would swear he's no, he was not. And uh, I happened to be in the, in the message center when those Germans came in. So they went, and I had no idea who they were or what they were, and I thought they were, first they were prisoners. And uh, they went by me, and they went by me, uh, by our message center again going out, and I have no uh, I had no idea uh, until uh, uh, later on. Now, were they officers or sergeants or? Uh, they were officers. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, I don't know what you know what rank of officers they were. I don't think they were high-ranking officers, uh, but but I, but they were officers. Okay. Okay. There, there, you know, there, we're limited in the time, but there are many things that happened in Bastogne. There were many scary things that tanks broke through one night, and the uh, uh, colonel told us to go out and stop them with a bazooka, which was all we had to stop them. And uh, we were practicing our surrender techniques. <laughs> we thought of stopping Tiger tanks. But uh, we were lucky. Uh, the Tiger texts uh, turned around uh, for some unknown reason uh, and, and never proceeded and turned around and went back down the road. We never knew. Uh, they may have been short on gasoline. We, mm -hmm. we don't know. But uh, we never had to do anything foolish like shooting a Tiger tank with a bazooka. Now, were, with you being in the Signal Corps in the headquarters, were you in contact with uh, other units at, at the time, or were you totally cut off? Uh, our regimental headquarters of our different regiments were fairly close. Remember, mm -hmm. we were surrounded. That's right. We were in a total hole. Okay. How I, about with units outside of the line? Oh, uh, we were are surrounded. Certain, okay, so you never had contact we with had, the outside world had, then at no, all? No contact. Mm -hmm. with, they, the, with them at all. Uh, our regiments were within, headquarters were within walking distance, which presented, we had a, our radios, and our power was handled by a generator, right. which were in uh, glass doors. And they were pulled down glass doors, and we had to leave them open so that, the, so that they didn't, uh, you know, gas didn't kill us. See, uh, carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Carbon monoxide. Right mm -hmm. uh, but uh, these glass doors were subject to uh, any kind of action from 88s falling in. So one of the most thrilling things to do, and we volunteered to do it, was every four hours we had to fill the gas tanks with jerry cans. So we took turns going out to the garage there 
And remember, that you can't hear anything mm. because the motor is running. So it's very thrilling to go out there with the, and stand there filling them with a funnel and a, a cherry can. And you don't know whether that's the time the Germans are going to start throwing the 88s in. And they, yet they often did. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, we moved to a stalag dumped by the Germans, which was about Oh, maybe 200 yards uh, away from uh, where, I, we were, where our offices were. And uh, it was underground and it was uh, shaped like a snake back and forth. And it was about uh, 10 feet underground, roofed over with railroad ties and earth and mound. And, uh, we, and it was uh, probably uh, six or eight feet wide, with benches all along the side. And uh, on the flooring, we would put down our, blank, our uh, sleeping bags, and, uh, and we lived in there. And uh, very often, the, at night, the 88s which would fall all around the outside, and uh, they never went through, to my knowledge. Uh, we'd go out the next day, and there'd be uh, you know, holes where the 88s would have hit. But uh, I slept through most of them, really. Uh, once in a while, you know, the ground mm -hmm. would move a here, but I really slept through most of them. Uh, one night, uh, and in fact, it was on New Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve, uh, in uh, 1940. Oh, I five. Forty-five, the year the war ended. That's, uh, uh, I was in a slip trench. I was supposed to be on uh, guard duty, and uh, a fellow named Koenig and I were in a slit trench. And uh, now I guess we weren't on duty, because we, but we were in a slit trench out there for some reason or other. I guess we were assigned to the perimeter out there. Anyway, he had a bottle of four roses, uh, and uh, we finished the bottle of four roses, and uh, it, uh, <laughs> I know we walked that parade ground, and our, and our the next day we could see our feet in the snow, and they weren't straight across the parade ground. <laughs> his his mother had sent him a bottle of a flat bottle of four roses, a pint, baked in a, in a uh, loaf of bread. <laughs> Anyway, do you want me to continue? Yes. Okay, we, from the, anyway, we got out, went back, broke through. We went uh, down to Hochfelden in Alsace, and I lived, it was, I was quartered in a, with a family called Meter. The Meter Familia, and I'll, it was at 9 Rue de la Guerre, Hochfelden in Alsace. That was the address. Uh, it must have been right near the railroad because Rudiger Laguerre means railroad. Uh, I, I didn't tell you that my family, my family, my mother's family is all German, and I lived with a German family at the time I was eight years old or older. Then we spoke German, and uh, I still can speak some German. You, you forget it over the years, but uh, but uh, German was not foreign to me. So I was not linguistic enough to be an interpreter. Mm -hmm. A very close friend of mine, uh, Leo Hertz, uh, Red Hertz, was interpreter for the division. And he was about uh, five feet tall, a paratrooper. We had to get him a small chute so he wouldn't go up in the air when we dumped <laughs> him out of the planes. Uh, we, and we had a lot of trouble getting a small chute for him. But, uh, and he spoke broken German. And uh, he was in my squad, and we were good friends. And uh, his mother and father died in a concentration camp. And uh, he used to tell everybody that, that Hitler made soap out of his mother and father. And that is probably what happened. His sister and he got out of uh, Germany and lived in Chicago, and uh, he died. Go back about 10 years ago, and his sister predeceased. Um, anyway, to continue, uh, I went off track a little bit. We got back down to a hotel. 
in Alsace and from Hope Felden. Uh, after we were there, as I was stationed, we, uh, we played cards with this family. They were a lovely family, Alsatian. Their son had been grabbed by the German army and, and made to, to join the German army. And, uh, they, uh, uh, we played cards with them at night and uh, they had wine and, and, and we slept in a little kind of a shack out in the back and uh, oh my lord we had a, slept in a bed that was like his feathers but must have been about four feet high you would you would climb into the thing and you would drop about two feet when you got into the bed you would sleep right into it it was but it was, it was very 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 nice there we got treated well good food there from there we went into Germany and now the war is winding down the Germans are back beaten back now they're back into Germany across the Rhine so we go over into Aachen and now we're convoying and we're advancing all of the division is advancing all the time and we're hopscotching, hopscotching uh, our our signal company has to have advanced signal company for the division, so we take units of our signal company as we always did, and, and set up advance where we're going, where we expect to be the next night, and uh, we run up and set up a signal uh, office there. Then the division meets us. Then we hopscop again. Somebody else moves ahead. Uh, we were hoping not to catch them. We hope that the Germans kept moving so fast that we really wouldn't have to catch them, which doesn't sound too brave, but, but honest. Uh, but we moved. Uh, actually, the Germans were still fighting then, and it was then that uh, we were behind the 99th Division, and it was in this uh, time that my brother was killed when the Germans were... Uh, How old was your brother? Was he younger? Or much younger, four years younger. And what was his name? Ro uh, Bob. Robert, mm -hmm. F. Robert Sheehan. Robert John Sheehan, it was, I'm sorry, it wasn't, it was Robert John, Robert J. Sheehan. And he was a PFC in the 99th Division. And now, how were you made aware of his death? I was standing guard, by the way, in combat, everybody stood guard. Uh, in when we were uh, not in combat, only uh, enlisted men, privates, corporals stood, not corporal, privates, yeah, maybe corporals stood guard. Uh, in combat, everybody stood guard. And so I happened to be standing guard in a graveyard. And I'll never tell you what town it was in. But uh, the, the lieutenant, uh, the lieutenant, and the uh, my first sergeant came out one night, and it was probably about eleven o'clock. And I may have been sergeant of the guard; I'm not sure. And uh, they told me that uh, they had some very bad news for me, and they would relieve me, and they relieved me, and I came back in, and they told me that they had just received word from the Red Cross that my brother had been killed 13 days before that. He was uh, riding in the back of a 6x6 and uh, an 88 shell landed uh, about 50 feet behind him and a very small particle, less than a quarter of an inch, entered his mouth and went up through the roof of his mouth and they didn't think that he was seriously injured. But uh, they took him to the hospital, and uh, it entered his brain, and he died. I think it was eight or, eight or nine days later. Uh, this was when the Germans had not forgotten to blow, blow up the mm -hmm. room, not done a good job at Red Market. Uh, after that, we went across on a pontoon bridge that was, that was constructed by a Corps of Engineers. Um, let me see, where are we now? Uh, well, we, were, we went down through Germany into, into Bavaria, into, uh, well, by the, at that time I got a week off and I, I went to, I had a week at Königsee 
and that's K O N I G M E T A N U M L A R U P D O. I think we would probably spell it K O E N I G. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a beautiful spot. I spent a week there, and we had to, the Germans were given sea rations, and they made marvelous food out of them. Uh, they were just marvelous chefs. Uh, and, and that was a week off, and then we went down to, oh, I'll never think of another place, but we were heading for uh, Birchdesgaden, and uh, finally we got down to Birchdesgaden, and uh, we took over the uh, SS barracks there, and it's, the, the war is practically over now. And in fact, the uh, the, the Germans are taking off their uniforms uh, as much as they, that's all they have, but they're taking off their insignia and they're keeping their uniforms. Uh, we're still chasing in the woods those die-hard Nazis, uh, SS troopers who, uh, who are not going to give up. But many of the youngsters, these 15, 17 year olds that were drafted into the German army, they don't want to do what they're doing. And, uh, and the, the war is over. Mm -hmm. So we lived very well in there. Our real, the time we were down there, uh, we went up to the, to the Eagle's Nest and saw Hitler's Nest. And we, our division took over the caverns where the paintings were, and uh, Hitler had stood his <coughs> chiefs had stolen paintings and artworks from all over, and these were recovered. And, uh, I don't know why they were brought back to their rightful owners, hopefully, anyway. Were you ever aware of the concentration camps? Yes. Uh, when we got to a some of the towns that we were in in Germany, I saw the concentration camps. I've spoken before about the town, and I'm not sure my brains are, uh, if, if you sat me down and thought for a long time, maybe I could tell you the name of the town. But we came into this one town in convoy one night, and all of these fellows are standing there in their pajamas on a hill. Uh, I'm being facetious. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. to it's them. Uh, they, uh, but they were in. They, they were the prisoners who had just gotten released from the by our fellows from the concentration camps. Uh, but that, that was the first I had seen. As we progressed <coughs> into town, uh, we ran into more barbed wire, or outside of town. This is barbed wire fences, and these were women's concentration camps. Uh, I probably later learned that they were all Polish women. Uh, I couldn't understand anybody. Some of the men were trying to talk to them, uh, but I don't think many of our... We had some fellows who were uh, underground farmers, miners from uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, they could speak Polish, but uh, with a German, uh, I could not understand any of them. And uh, so, uh, quit. No. Uh, so, uh, my recollection of going, seeing much of the concentration camp is not too good. Uh, we, we, our boys and we had my squad with them and my close friends were a lot of them were Jewish, and uh, uh, they, we were kids. People don't realize that we didn't think of concentration camps as we think of them in history today. <coughs> we were a bunch of kids, uh, scared that we were going to get killed. Uh, the Jewish boys uh, were scared stiff that we might surrender when we were surrounded because uh, and, uh, and they were, these are wonderful young, there are no younger, a few of them still around, some of them live in Florida. My closest friends, uh, Van Silverstein lived in Paramus, New Jersey, and uh, as I said, Leo Hertz lived in Chicago. Uh, 
they were not terribly concerned with the concentration camps. We, at this time, we, even though they were aware and we knew all about concentration camps, we were maybe selfish and worried about uh, getting home and things like that. We didn't know the things that went on in concentration mm -hmm. camps at this time. Okay. Why don't we go to a new table? Okay. Okay. You asked me, uh, you know, many, I, I haven't spoken this much <coughs> since the war, except that the only time I talk about this is if I'm talking to George Koskimaki or some of the guys that were with us who relate to what I'm talking about. I've spoken at schools and Children today don't study history. They don't have any idea of what I'm talking about. And it's, it's hard for them to realize that we were their age. And it, we weren't any different. We were scared kids. We, we, we were being drafted. When, we, when I was drafted, I went to the armory on, on Washington Avenue in Albany, and there were about 17 doctors in a perimeter around the basketball court. And you were run practically at a trot for these 17 doctors who checked you as you ran by. Pretty much so. And unless you had a broken eardrum or a broken leg if it wouldn't go right, boom, you passed. Uh, they couldn't pass me because I weighed 108 pounds. That's how I got to be 4F. It's hard for kids today to understand that all my friends were in service in the Army or the Navy. I went down and tried to enlist in the Navy until I saw their uniforms. And I said, oh my God, I could never wear that uniform. I said, I had to be going to the Army. I thought of the Air Force, but uh, and I had flown under CAA while in Siena. And, uh, however, we had a death. A young man by the name of Luther Emery, why it comes back to me now, I'll never know. His family ran a shoe store on Maiden Lane in Albany. And he was killed when he took my plane up. We were flying Piper Cubs. And I looked my plane over one night, and it had frayed cables on the tail. And I said, I don't want to take that plane. I don't want to fly that plane. I'm not going to fly that plane tonight. I'll come back next week. And of course, kids, ah, go on, Sheehan, you know, come on. And Luther took that plane up. And it, a cable frayed, I don't know whether it was that night or the next night, but he flew that night. And that's who was killed. The, the, plane, the tail will let go. Uh, the instructor lived, and I can't think of his name. Huh? Discharged. Discharged in, uh, I had 85 points. By the way, we had a point deal yes. with the war ended. And I had more than 85 points. I think I had probably 90 some points. And uh, the division was planning on going to Japan. And I went, I asked my uh, captain, could I see the colonel? Because I didn't want to go to Japan. I had enough points. I wanted to be discharged. I was married. My brother had been killed. My mother was uh, president of the Gold Star Mothers and uh, first president in this area of the Gold Star Mothers. And uh, I wanted to be discharged. So I went to see the colonel. And after we had a little talk, uh, he offered me a commission. And I said, no, I want out. And OK, he said, OK. And he signed my papers, transferring me to an artillery outfit that was down in Bordeaux. Preparing to come home, they told me. Uh, as it turned out, I think he, he knew what he was doing. 
Uh, the division got on the boats to go to Japan. The war ended with the uh, bomb in, over Hiroshima. And I was still in Bordeaux waiting to go home. Finally, I got aboard a uh, victory ship, Cork, and 20 days later, I was landed in Norfolk, Virginia. And this was the, I think the, uh, it was pre pretty close to Christmas. It was pretty close to Christmas. I'm not sure what date it was. But I know I got on a train and, uh, when we got to the Rensselaer Yards, the train got stuck there, and I said, fooey on this, and I grabbed my barracks bag, and I walked off the train and walked across from Rensselaer to Albany, and I got a taxi and went home. Okay, did you uh, ever make use of the GI Bill? Yeah, I bought a house. I, don't think, I think I bought that on the GI Bill. I bought a house mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, Westmere. Did you use the 5220 club at all? Ah, uh, yes, for a short time. I went to, by the way, I went to law school. After I, I went back to Siena and finished up my accounting. Then I went to Albany Law School and uh, went with uh, an announcer, who I won't think of his name, from WGY, and a fellow named Sherp Herrick, who announced the senator, New York senator, Albany Senator James. And uh, we all quit the uh, Albany Law School on the same day. We went down to the down at Dana Avenue to the club and finished a couple pitchers of beer and decided that Albany Law School was not for us. Did you join any veterans organizations? No. I uh, joined the 101st Airborne Association. We were not I don't know why, but the 101st Airborne was a group by itself. We, many of the airborne never joined other, uh, we, we, we talked a different kind of a language than the regular army. And uh, it was hard for us to, 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 to belong and to talk about the things we did in war. Mm -hmm. And so it, only when we talked with the 100 members, with members of the 101st Airborne, did you did you um, stay in contact with anyone? I know you alluded to that. But oh yes, many. I came and stayed in contact with Ben Silverstein, and uh, and uh, uh, Lordy, he stayed in contact uh, with many of the with the guys the, the, that were uh, trying to think of uh, uh, oh, the guys. Who are around the area? Mm -hmm. I did stay in contact. Did you ever go to any reunions? Yes, yes, we, we went to a few reunions. Uh, we went, I went to one out in Omaha, <coughs> uh, which was great reunion. Uh, we I went to one around here, and I can't think where. And I had gotten together with. Um, in New York City with, uh, with some of the guys who mm -hmm. were at the 101st Airborne. What we talked on the telephone fairly often. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked mainly with George, with Ben, and uh, the other fellows. Okay, um, how do you think your time in the service had a change or had an effect on your life? Oh, tremendously. Tremendously. I often, even now, think of the the things that we did together and then when, when we were in service. Mm -hmm. uh, the, those days, uh, they, they were different. I never thought I would wind up in the 100, I never thought I'd be in the Army. Or, mm -hmm. I never thought I'd be in the 101st Airborne. Uh, I'm happy that I was in the 101st Airborne. I don't think that there's another outfit that I would have wanted to be in. I don't think that the, the, they were head and shoulders uh, to me, above any outfit that I would want to be in. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if you could hold this up. Okay. Nice. Let's 
All right, what's the top photograph show? The top photograph is the first clear day at Bastogne that the supply C-47s were able to get through to us. Mm -hmm. And they were dropping packages of food, ammunition, uh, guns, uh, replacement, um, uh, everything that we needed, medical supplies especially, we were in desperate shape. Our, our 326 medics had been overrun by the Germans and captured. So we had wounded men who were not able to get, uh, we, were, we had run out of morphine. We all carried morphine and when we gave up everything that we could to the guys who were in the trenches. I told you before that I was able to have extra blankets. I, I was able to give up all of my, I kept two clips of ammunition and I gave all of the rest of my ammunition to the guys who were out on the perimeter doing the fighting. Uh, I had six blankets. Uh, I kept one and gave them to the blankets. So all the extra stuff that I had brought with me, I was able to send out to the guys uh, who were doing the fighting out on the Now perimeter. what does the bottom picture show? Uh, after the uh, fighting was over, we helped the people of the town of Bastogne bring their belongings back in. We carried them back into their homes. And uh, so we, there was a statue at the foot of, uh, by the railroad in Bastogne. And uh, the statue said Bastogne. So three of us who were very close together, uh, Milt Reese kneeling down, myself in the middle, and Ben, uh, Silverstein, who was the boy from Paramus, New Jersey. Uh, Milt was from uh, from uh, California. He worked before the war. He had worked for Disney Studios. Uh, but the three of us t t t took our picture. And I think it was a fellow named Clem Hassenfuss who was took our picture. The four of us were together. Clem lived in Boston, mm -hmm. and he died a few years ago. Okay. These are all dead. These now, if you just show us these, yeah. this one on top is you in, is that you in Basson area? Yes. Well, this is in the fields uh, back, the top picture, back of Baston, and I must tell you that that's a posed picture. <laughs> I never figured you know, it was. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's in a slit trench, but you can get an idea how uh, the slit trenches. This was taken in when things had calmed down naturally and we could stand up and do things like take pictures around so without being shot at. Uh, Excuse me. And it was... Go ahead. No. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Finish. Uh, there was... A, what was there? There were several mesh units that were copied from our uh, experiences in Bastogne. One was 5 o'clock Charlie, if you remember one that the, the, the fellow used to come over in a plane, a German plane, and he, at five o'clock every night, who would drop a bomb. Well, when we were at the uh, stone there, every night about five o'clock, a single plane would come over to try and break, to try and hit the bridge coming into Bastogne. And he would drop a 500 pound bomb each of the first few nights we were there. Well, the third night we were there, dropped a 500-pound bomb, and it landed back of our building. And in, there were a the monastery there where the nuns rolled bandages every night, and our 506 regimental headquarters located, because I remember walking in at night, bringing messages down. We took turns, by the way, bringing messages, because it was very, very dark, and uh, we would carry a flashlight with a hand over the, just to see our feet. And uh, this 500-pound bomb was dropped in the alley there, and it never went off. And it just lay there all the time we were in Baston. But anyway, those pictures were taken in the... So no, no, this one here. Uh, that was taken before we went to the marshalling areas. Again, uh, posed 
uh, this was when we were first told, beat that we were, the invasion was imminent. We were uh, told to get down and draw all of the equipment we needed. So we're drawing the first, you go in line, if they're handing out flashlights, you pick up your flashlight, you pick up your trenching tool, you stand in line uh, for each thing that you need, you don't get everything at one time. So, uh, so this was a Polish picture with a, probably with the, with the folding, no, that was a straight stock carbon, I think, uh, which I didn't like because they you know, were a little bit too bulky and too heavy. But we had folding stock carbon, which were for the paratroopers. And uh, everybody wanted a folding stock carbon because it, could, it had a pistol grip. You could fire it as a pistol or a, a, a carbine, 30 caliber. Didn't have much stopping power, but uh, it, it was easier to run with. Okay, thank you very much.